But I just want to take a quick second and kind of frame in the discussion to say what is innovation. So again, you've all seen this metaphor, but how this applies to what we do is that innovation is a thing. It's a product. It's a service. In, in the, grammatically, innovation is a noun. It's a, and so that's what we see above water. Um, when I ask groups examples of innovation, nine, 99 times out of 100, uh, <laughs> the answer is the iPhone. But again, the iPhone is just a thing. Um, what lies underneath the surface to the iPhone's success is not only a process, but a mindset. So what I want to emphasize to you is the importance of developing a mindset and that designer's mindset underpins a process because we would never ask you to blindly follow a process. We want you to take that process with a belief inside of you that it's the right way to approach it. And then following that process, the outcomes are innovations. Um, and I'll give you a, a very quick, it's a non-medical example, but I think it paints the picture pretty well. So this is uh, Samuel Langley, and uh, raise your hand if you know that Sam, uh, would call Samuel Langley a pioneer of flight. Uh, most of you wouldn't, but he was a uh, kind of a Washington wheel and dealer back at the turn of the, of the 20th century, uh, had great political connections and was able to establish a, or, or secure a $50,000 grant from the US government to build a flying machine. So he builds the, uh, float, floating, floating. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you call it a pontoon or whatever you call it. He builds that boat that he sails out into the middle of the Potomac. Um, the the riverbank is lined with dignitaries, um, his contacts, his networks, looking on as uh, Samuel Langley and team will produce the first human-powered flight. And as you can see from the picture, um, his contraption very quickly uh, plunges into the Potomac River, and it's a failure. And the reason I call it a failure is because Langley closed up shop and never uh, went on to pursue that. The reason why, uh, as has been talked about, is because he was in it for his own personal gain. He wanted the outcome to be the person who developed flight. Um, underpinning that was not a process or a mindset. And so we keep this very simple framework here that we'll walk through is just the, what I call superpowers are really the mindsets. So you've got to have the mindset and we'll talk about that. Then what is the system or the process that sits on top of that mindset? Um, that system or process, what I would argue, and perhaps because, come, because I come from a business school, is that a business model needs to underlay that innovation. So frankly, the iPhone is not an innovation. The innovation is the iTunes store, which creates the demand for the end node, which is the iPhone. If you look at Facebook, they want to build the metaverse, but ultimately I believe they'll fail because they don't control the end node. Um, if you and I are hanging out, uh, or if you and I are friends and I'm halfway around the world at a concert and I ping you to say, hey, join me at this concert, are you gonna stop in the middle of your workday and put on an Oculus headset to, uh, to join me at this concert? Like highly unlikely. Um, it's just, it's bulky. It takes you away from reality. And, and I don't think humans are ready to disconnect from that reality, at least within this generation. So uh, that's just a very quick example of, it's not the outcome, right? It's it, the iPhone or the Oculus headset. They are the strategic tools to lock in your customer. But the real underlying innovation is the uh, iTunes store. And what I would argue is, is that the metaverse is too big for Facebook to own. So they're going to carve out a piece of it, but they're not going to own it. And, and therefore, uh, I don't know that they'll be that successful. But that's a, a diversion from uh, Mr. Langley. So if we go back to what are the superpowers that, or, or what is that mindset? Well, the designer's mindset is made up of many things, but the three that I would want to impart with you today are empathy. And uh, just as a medical, because this is a medical group, uh, I'll talk for a moment on empathy. There's really cognitive empathy and emotional empathy. Cognitive empathy means I can understand what you're going through. Empathy, uh, emotional empathy is when you really sit on that other side of the table. And so I would argue that doctors cannot be empathic um, at all times. It's just not, they, they, no one has that reservoir within them. Uh, you'll burn out. 
And so as a doctor, it's understanding that difference and, and practicing that cognitive empathy of having those lived experiences and be able to show your patient that you recognize or recognize where they're coming from, but that you don't have the capacity to sit on the same side of the table as them at all times. Uh, back to these superpowers. So besides empathy, we have curiosity and creativity. And there's often a very stark red thread, as I call it, woven through history that goes back from earliest inspirations to today. So if we look at the challenge facing Samuel Langley and the desire to fly, where are some of those earliest inspirations? Well, if we think about it, these are actually artifacts found within a tomb in ancient Egypt that date uh, back to almost 3000 BC. Now, again, this just could be passed as a bird, right? It, 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 um, maybe that has some significance. But if we look at it through a very technical eye in the other direction, notice that on the back end, it actually has a, a vertical tail. I don't know many birds that have vertical tails, but I, knew, I do know a lot of airplanes that have vertical tails. And so again, may the Egyptians have been onto something and it was lost when the great library of Alexandria burned to the ground. We don't know. Uh, but just if we go back in history, there's clues that we can piece together. So let's just use this as evidence that for a long time, humans have had the desire. There has been that curiosity um, of how to fly. So whether the Egyptians were able to put a system on top of that, we don't know. But some of the earliest systems that we can find come from the Renaissance and Da Vinci. And this is a sketch uh, in the upper left corner that he made of a flying machine and, and how he began to conceptualize that here in, in the bigger picture. So he's beginning to apply a process. He's beginning to build a system around this human-centered motivation. Now, it wasn't successful, um, as we know, but that inspiration is there and it's not, it hasn't left. So then we move forward to the Wright brothers and you would all raise your hand knowing that the Wright brothers are um, credited with human powered flight. What makes them different than Langley? Well, Langley was in it for the innovation. The Wright brothers were tinkerers. They were curious. They were comfortable with iteration. Um, if you kind of look at Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, and you read the story of Paul Revere and how he was able to get he's credited with getting his information out because he had the broadest network. And the, the Wright brothers had a deep network of fellow tinkers that they were able to pull from. And so for them, it was this process of collaboration that led to the outcome. Now, today we are not flying, uh, uh, we don't fly on the Wright brothers airline. So somewhere along the way, this transitioned from a pretty cool experiment to something that is actually financially viable. And so just as a trivia question here, does anyone know who the first cover, um, uh, who first uh, was one of the first customers of the early investors in human powered flight? Jeff Bezos. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe human powered space flight. How about that? Uh, well, so the, uh, this is where the business model comes in. And quite frankly, uh, the business model for how to make flying viable didn't exist. So enter the US government. Uh, the government is a very famous backer of new technologies. Think about medicine. For how many years did the government offer grants um, into various forms of vaccine, and I don't have the details, but holistically, they are big investors in early stage medical uh, research and discovery through the National Institutes of Health and other groups, uh, because it's that 30 year history of mRNA vaccination research that got us to the point where we're at today, where we are able to respond to a pandemic in record time. So if the first customer was the U.S. mail, why would the U.S. mail be an ideal customer for, to test this business model of flight? Unmet need. Unmet need. And what would that need be? Faster, cheaper, smarter, Got better. Got it. Manifest destiny. You've got, you can control broader area, the faster you can move information around that area. 
Um, other benefits to moving mail, uh, mail doesn't really get upset if your flight's delayed due to bad weather. Um, if your plane crashes, it's unfortunate for the pilot, but uh, beyond that, the number of casualties are limited. And so as you can see, that this was a, it was actually a perfect prototype in the sense of moving from the low fidelity prototype that we saw with the Wright brothers to a high fidelity prototype here. And again, but still not ready for customer facing. So the technological uh, challenges were, were beginning to be overcome. Uh, there was a business model behind this. The government had subsidized it, brought in many uh, regional players that came together, which little known facts, for example, why Delta Airlines is called Delta, because it started in Georgia and it was flew around the, the Mississippi Delta and connected those, so just as an example. But now we come to what are what we would call the innovations, and I would say this is the Pan Am China Clipper. I would say this, when it was launched in the you know the late 30s, early 40s, this was an innovation, right? The ability to travel across uh, the Pacific Ocean, even if you had to make multiple stops, you could now have transoceanic flight. That's the innovation. But without the business model underlying it, uh, it really wasn't possible. So. I share all that as a way to just reinforce again, this model of superpowers, systems, business models, and then innovations.